All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. And I'd like to thank you all for joining today on this webinar on incorporating nutrition into Feed the Future research programs. Uh, as you can see, this webinar is being recorded. So if you'd like to review any of the content at a later basis or share it out with your colleagues, uh, we'll make sure to send the recording to everyone who joined this webinar today. I'd like to thank those who have already introduced yourselves in the chat box. If you haven't done so yet, please let us know uh, where you're joining from, which innovation lab you are associated with, uh, what city states you're joining from. Uh, it's great to just have introductions. And please feel free to network with your colleagues using the chat box, uh, ask questions at any point, and uh, just let us know uh, about any interesting resources or links that you'd like to share with the group. Um, we are welcome your questions uh, at any point throughout this webinar, although we will be pausing for a longer Q&A session at the end uh, after the presentation. But if we, see, if we see any essential clarifying questions along the way, we'll be sure to uh, jump in and answer them. If you would like to download the slides from the presentation, you can do so in the file downloads box that's over there to the left. And we'll make sure to send you a, a copy of the slides after that fact as well. All right, so I figure we should just go ahead and jump right in to the content. Uh, but first, I'd like to, uh, we'd like to introduce the speakers. And I will start out by uh, introducing Ahmed Kablan uh, with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. I will show you his bio slide and photo right here. And he is the activity manager for the Feed the Future Soybean Innovation Lab and the Feed the Future Nutrition Innovation Labs for Africa and Asia. And so I'll go ahead and let Ahmed uh, introduce our subsequent speakers. So passing it over to you, Ahmed. Uh, thank you, Julie. Um, <clears throat> hi, hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us today for uh, this webinar. Uh, our, uh, uh, the other speakers, we have Dr. Jeffrey Griffiths from Tufts University. And he's the director for the Feed the Future Innovation Lab Africa. Dr. Webb Patrick Webb. <clears throat> Dean of Academic Affairs, Friedman School of Nutrition, and the Director for Feed the Future Innovation Lab Asia. And Maura Mack, Nutrition Advisor at uh, USAID Bureau for Security, Office of Agriculture and Policy, and she is the EOR uh, for both Feed the Future Innovation Labs and for the Soybean Innovation Lab. Uh, in my first presentation, I will give it about the just an overview of the global context of the malnutrition problem and some terminology that we uh, commonly use um, in case you are looking for uh, too majority in your program or looking at the impact of your program on this uh, uh, different indicators. Now, what's malnutrition? Malnutrition, as we know, it is composed of two parts, the undernutrition and overnutrition. Undernutrition. It is stunting, underweight, wasting. That's the manifestation of it. And we'll go into how we decide, uh, measure it later. And overnutrition, obesity, and overweight. Both of those uh, malnutrition problems, or uh, uh, they, they are share, among other things, micronutrient deficiency. As we know, the impact of uh, malnutrition has a multi-sectoral impact. And as uh, it's just as it is multi-sectors that will need to work together in order to produce an impact or reduction in malnutrition, also the cause or the impact of it is multi-sectoral. It affects on the health. We know that uh, from the recent statistics, it contributes to about 45% of under-5 death. Uh, education, the lower uh, IQ and poorer performance in schools. Uh, it have had a negative impact on economic growth, uh, an estimated loss of about 3 to 6 percent of the annual GDP. Uh, of course, poverty, uh, wages for those who are stunted or malnourished are half of those of adults who are normal uh, children, and also to aggravate the conditions of other infectious diseases and make the treatment for them uh, harder to achieve the uh, targets. And also with the side, with the side of uh, overnutrition, the are at, uh, the children who are stunted are at higher risk of nutrition-related uh, uh, non-communicable diseases, such as type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. 
Now, in order to just have an idea about the effect of nutrition and mortality, and you can see in the figure here, the shaded areas indicate the contribution of undernutrition to each cause of death, uh, uh, whether it is from pneumonia, diarrhea, measles, or malaria. The overall is underlying cause of about 45%, as I mentioned, and one in five children uh, is stunted. That would give a total number of about 165 million uh, children are stunted worldwide. And most of those, or majority of those, lie in 34 countries in low and middle income countries. Also, small birth to weight, as we learned from the recent Lancet series, contribute to about 3.3% of total children death. Malnutrition, as we all know, is the result of insufficient intake uh, and, and consumption of healthy and nutritious food, inadequate care, and infectious disease, which include the stunting, which is uh, height for age, or the ch child will be short for the age and administered as a chronic, uh, it is a result of a chronic inadequate intake of nutrient over time. And the effect of it, it's poor cognition function, lower lifetime uh, earning, uh, greater risk of NCDs. Wasting, which is uh, measured by <clears throat> their weight for, a, for height or they are thin for their height. And this results from an acute condition and adequate intake of calories, such as in case of uh, human disasters or conflict, and increase the risk of uh, morbidity and mortality. And their weight, and we are measuring it by uh, weight for age. These children they are manifested by low weight for their age, and it could result from a chronic or acute. And uh, it associates with increased ri uh, risk of mortality and morbidity. Overweight and obesity, which is measured if you for uh, weight for age. These children they are, as we know, what is an obese or overweight, they have high weight for their age and it is a result from a chronic and acute overconsumption of calories. Um, there is a, a, a debate in the scientific community working in this side whether uh, the period of uh, some, some they say that up, up to four weeks of uh, consumption of unhealthy diet will lead to an irreversible conditions or hard to reverse conditions in terms of obesity or overweight. Again, overweight and obesity, as you can see, it shared with stunting, the poor cognition, higher risk of NCDs, and lower lifetime earning. And micronutrient deficiency, which is shared among uh, all these forms of malnutrition, and it is uh, an inadequate take intake of vitamins or minerals, or uh, 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 such as vitamin A deficiency, which is a very common uh, in low and middle income countries, and lead to blindness, stunting, uh, and other manifestation. And if we want to look how we measure uh, uh, these different conditions according to WHO classification of nutrition status, as an example, I will just go over a stunting, for example, which is uh, reflects chronic malnutrition. And when it is measured height for weight, it is uh, a moderate stunting or those who are too this core. Uh, normal height for their age, and the severe is a three Z uh, below their normal height. And if we want to look at the nutritional status uh, for uh, the countries which are considered, which are the focus country for feed the future countries, um, we have higher rate of stunting uh, overall. Uh, for example, in Guatemala, it is about 50 percent. Uh, in Senegal, 29. Rwanda, 44 percent. Also, we still have a significantly a significant high number of wasted uh, children, 16% uh, in Bangladesh. Underweight also, as you can see, is still at, at a high rate. And at the same time, the stunted mother or a stunted woman is represent a risk to give birth for a stunted child. And that's when you look at the woman BMI as less than 18.5, which is the cutoff cut point for a normal body weight. It is very high in Bangladesh at 33 percent, and as you can go down the list, the number range between 33 to 8 percent. Now, what what causes malnutrition? Multi, malnutrition causes are multi-sectoral and mul, mul, uh, multiple factors contribute to this. And most of you in this uh, 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 webinar, they are familiar with the uh, casual uh, cause framework for nutrition. There, there are two 
immediate determinant of the nutritional status. It is the food intake and the health. And um, it is the problem is not only about the food. It is the quality of the food that you are consuming. And at the same time, there is other factors that Dr. Griffiths will go over them and Dr. Webb uh, that uh, determine the nutritional outcomes of how um, the, the body will respond to taking this uh, nutritious and healthy food, whether they will benefit totally from it or not. So I need to postpone the start. Um, the leading of this course to the critical contributors, it is in terms of the food security, it's access for food and the uh, availability of the food, maternal and child health and care practices, and uh, the water sanitation and hygiene, the topics of water sanitation and uh, health services will be uh, talked in depth. Uh, or, uh, Dr. Griffiths will cover them, and other factors will be covered by Dr. Webb. Now, in order to have an impact, an actual impact on malnutrition, we need all these sectors to work together, whether it's food security, the care resources, the health and nutrition, uh, the wash or the health sanitation uh, de uh, department, all of them need to work together in order to, to obtain the optimum child feeding and nutritional outcomes. Um, <clears throat> now, what is why we are focusing or targeting the 1,000 days of uh, the child, which is from the time of conception to the second birth uh, date of the child. It is the period where the child are most, uh, the children are most vulnerable from the time they are in the womb until they are two years of age, and the intervention at this period are not likely to have. Uh, they are after this period, sorry, they are not likely to have the same impact or significant impact as intervention during this period, and they have the most impact on the long-term consequences of the outcomes. And just to brush on some of the infant and young child feeding, uh, it is start from a preconception because you need to have a healthy woman in order uh, to be able to carry a healthy child. And in the period from zero to six months after birth, exclusive breastfeeding is uh, one of the uh, uh, important factors in order to achieve the uh, uh, the nutrition, the best nutrition outcomes and also it helped to build the immune system, the gut bacteria content, uh, all the com healthy components for the child body. And after that, 6 to 24 months, the breastfeeding assist assisted with complementary feeding introduction at a suitable age and the suitable uh, uh, kind of complementary feeding. The key points of this nutrition uh, uh, to as a basic the mortality, again, I can't insist on important that's how high it is, and it's an unacceptable high rate, 45% of all child death is related to malnutrition. <clears throat> In an era, we are producing a lot of food, which is enough for everyone, but it is uh, the problem still persists. Uh, uh, the three underlying causes, or main underlying causes, malnutrition, food security, care and practice, and the health, and uh, the critical window of intervention that is very uh, crucial for to produce an impact on any child life, it is the first thousand days from conception to two years of age. What is the relation between child malnutrition and GDB? And I think Dr. Patrick Webb will also talk more into that. But according to the least recent Lancet series by Ruel and Erdman in 2013 published, a 10% increase in GDB will result in about 6% reduction in stunting. And a 10% increase in GDB also leads to a 7% increase in overweight and obesity in women. So there is the benefit part, and there is the negative consequences of increasing GDB. And as you can see, it is not a linear relationship. It is not a 10% increase in GDB. GDB will lead to the same reduction in stunting. And that tells us there is multiple other factors that are on any play to determine the nutritional outcomes. So in summary, in order to achieve an improved in nutrition, it is a multi-sectoral approach. It is not one thing. It's not agriculture alone. It's not health or providing the healthy, uh, the nutritious diet. It is agriculture to produce, provide the food, increase household income, 
reduction in uh, food prices, uh, the provide the high density, high, uh, high high nutrition density food, social programming, social behavior, and health. And thank you. We'll pass it now to Dr. Griffith. Thank you very much. Let me go ahead and start um, by pointing out that there are some unexpected linkages between things like mycotoxins or aflatoxins and sanitation. What I'd like to do in this talk is go ahead and um, outline what some of those are and then also uh, discuss uh, the paradigm that the lack of foods has been the key issue. Uh, but I don't think that that is the one that I want to focus on, although that's important. There are other things which are uh, critical elements as well. I think many of us grew up with the paradigm, which is that somehow or other, if we could just feed people enough, we could make up for these nutritional deficiencies like stunting and wasting. And that other outcomes, such as low birth weight, micronutrient deficiencies, could be essentially taken care of by filling up the tank. I want to go ahead and just put a visual representation in front of everyone. These are stunted children. Um, and um, these are children who are then short for their age. These children here, this is a child who's wasted. This should say low weight for height. It is an extreme form of low weight for age, but wasting is a child who, even if that child was proportionately small, say a stunted child, they might not be wasted. So this is a typo. This should be wasting as low weight for height, but it's an extreme form of low weight for age. So you can see this poor child here is really um, just skin and bones, and that's what we see with wasting, which is a nutritional emergency. Now. If the problem was just put adding more food, then we should be able to fix the problem through agricultural interventions, which help poor farmers to grow more food. Um, and there's been a paradigm which was more food production would lead to more income and better nutrition. And there is a relationship there. But I'd like to point out that it's not as strong as many of us had supposed in the past. This is data from the World Bank, and you can see that while there is a good relationship between increasing income and a decrease in underweight in, for very poor people, once people start to have a higher um, um, uh, uh, per capita income, this relationship becomes much weaker. And indeed, um, it, it, there's only modest improvement that we see. This is data provided by our colleague, Will Masters, who looked at information on poverty and malnutrition in Uganda. And you can see that although poverty has improved, we don't see a commensurate change in indicators of nutritional status uh, that would go along with those. There's been reference to the 2000 13 Lancet series. Um, I only will, this will be talked about at greater length by Dr. Webb, who is in fact an author of, of uh, the series. And I just want to point out that the uh, Lancet series found that if the top 10 classic nutrition interventions uh, were implemented, then stunting would decrease by 20%. And um, that is uh, not a very number for many of us. We had hoped that, in fact, through nutrition interventions, perhaps we could decrease stunting by a much higher percentage. If we look at many relevant nutrition actions, which are listed in the bottom of this slide, um, you can see that these are um, a part and parcel of many programs that we have. But the, the sort of the bad news, or at least the reality check, is that this is not going to address as much of these conditions, such as stunting, as we had hoped. In this talk, I'll talk a little bit more about these mycotoxins and the gut microbiome and enteropathy 
and explain a bit more about how they're important and how they relate through water and sanitation. This is a simple diagram. I would ask all of you to imagine that that cylinder on your right is your intestine. And your intestine um, is inflamed. This is a condition called environmental enteropathy, which I'll go into. And um, when you think about trying to address nutrition, um, it's not only that a person is ingesting foods, the micro and macronutrients, um, your intestine is also affected by other things that you eat besides the foods, which are various bacteria and also these aflatoxins. The result of this is that your intestine can become inflamed and not work as well as it should, and you have unusual and non-beneficial, actively adverse bacteria inside your intestine. If you look at this diagram, this picture here, this is an old picture of mine from urban Nairobi. Here you can see that sewage, which is leaking out of this um, sewer main right here, is actually used to irrigate these crops, which are quite green and quite healthy looking. However, uh, obviously there's a great risk of contamination. So the water that's used in agriculture can act as a way of transmitting bad bacteria which would be from the sewage to the foods that people eat. And in fact, if we think about what water might have in it, um, water for irrigation purposes will often come from an area where animals have also been excreting uh, their feces. If you look at agricultural wastewater, it frequently will contain many different bacteria. So this little laundry list that I have here of bacteria and parasites and viruses that are found in agricultural wastewater, um, it, it, it basically is um, demonstrating that many of these things that come from, say, cattle can also affect and make humans ill. So for example, E. coli, very commonly found in feces, um, are also found in other mammals and humans as well. When we think about small farm holders, small uh, farmers and households in uh, much of the poor world, um, the water that they use, uh, for example, may be contaminated both by um, other people or by animals. And there's a process which occurs, which is these nasty bacteria which are ones that cause illness, make their way through food and water into your intestine. They then create a condition called environmental enteropathy. And this is a really important uh, piece to this talk, which is to understand that these abnormal bacteria cause a chronic inflammation of the intestine and um, that this is an important contributor to malnutrition. In this picture, you can see um, what the normal villi of the intestine look like. So for those of you without a biomedical education, your intestine has little tiny fingers that are sticking out there to help absorb food. And that's what you see in this top left-hand photograph. That's what you see right here, these little fingers that are used to absorb food and nutrients. However, people with chronic inflammation which is what you see here, no longer have these nice fingers sticking up. They're blunted, and they're not working properly. What's been found in studies that go back actually all the way to the 1970s is that people with this environmental enteropathy require more protein and carbohydrates in order to uh, keep their um, uh, nutritional state at the same place as someone who does not have that. Now, enteropathy is something which is a silent thing. You don't necessarily have diarrhea. You don't necessarily have some other acute illness with enteropathy. And in fact, when we look at things like hand washing, which is an important sanitary intervention, what's important to understand is that by hand washing, 
you can decrease a condition such as uh, uh, diarrhea. But it doesn't mean that it changes the bacteria which are inside of your intestine, and it doesn't mean that it's changed that inflammation that occurs for people who are living in a highly contaminated environment. So when we think about water, sanitation, etc., it's important to think that um, there's a whole package of things which include sanitation. And a single piece of it, such as promoting hand washing, will help with diarrheal disease, but it doesn't help with everyone who's got enteropathy. This little picture, this diagram here, is from a paper by a guy named Nunt Lun, excuse me, who was important in understanding all of this science uh, over the last several decades. And I have included this simply to point out that the way that this is thought to work is that you get these bad bacteria into your intestine. They cause some chronic damage. And it means that your intestine is no longer functioning well as a barrier to the stuff that's inside your intestine. That can leak across the intestine and cause the inflammation. And at the same time, this mucosal damage that is the lining of the intestine, it doesn't work as well in terms of what it's supposed to do in terms of digesting food. And you end up with growth faltering because of these linked processes. So if you focus on a village of 100 children where one child has diarrhea, this child here, you will prevent illness in that child. However, you have not necessarily helped all the other children because they live in an unsanitary environment and they have this condition called environmental enteropathy. They are still prone to malnutrition. We've talked a little bit then about this enteropathy and how it affects 99%, if not more, of people living in an unsanitary environment. When we think about the bacteria that are inside the intestine, I've mentioned that some are from animals, some are from other people. Um, it's important to understand that they act as a community. And there's a paper that was published a year ago in Science which is really very interesting in terms of understanding these little devil bacteria that live in your intestine. And <clears throat> let me uh, cut to the chase in this, in the sense that um, there was a study which looked, this study looked at twins in Malawi. And these children, half of whom were uh, well-nourished, half were malnourished. And they looked at the spectrum of bacteria in these children. And even when they received ready, um, um, the, this food stuff that's the uh, therapeutic food called RUTF, their bacterial spectrum did not change in the normal way. When these bacteria were put into mice, I want to focus on this. This is quite important. When you took mice who were given the bacteria from normal children, these mice, you can see their weight stays about the same here. However, when bacteria from the children with malnutrition, Quashiorcor, which is a, um, um, uh, a child who is uh, bloated with stunting, I showed you a picture of that earlier, into these mice, look at the weight that the mice lost. They lost a third of their body weight in less than three weeks. The point of this is that the kind of abnormal bacteria in your, in your intestines can, caught, can be a contributor to weight loss and malnutrition. The other piece of this for the science is that when you have these abnormal bacteria living in your intestine, it turns out that they change your metabolism. And this bizarre kind of looking chart here tells you about whether or not the metabolic products of the food are increasing or decreasing. And the bad news is that in children with these bad bacteria living in there, there are decreases in critical metabolic pathways. So we're beginning to understand the biological basis for this now. So please remember you have environmental 
mental enteropathy, and they will also have spectrum of bacteria living in the intestine that may actively contribute to their malnourished status. Let me now go ahead and turn to aflatoxins. If we look at aflatoxins, excuse me, um, if, if we look, ooh, I've got these out of, you know, I'm going to go ahead and actually just skip this because I've talked about the microbiome. The important point that I want to have here is that malnourished children and obese people have a less diverse microbiome. And people who have a normal microbiome, one that has not got those bad bacteria, uh, may tend to have a normal uh, 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 body mass index. Let me go on and talk here about um, the evidence for sanitation. And, uh, and I will get back to the aflatoxin issue. I, uh, um, that slide was out of order. My apologies. So there is some evidence that this business of sanitation is quite important when we look at data sets from 60 different countries. There's a paper by Dean Spears. He did this work. It's been published by World Bank. And in this, um, he looked at data from many different countries and looked at this business of a contaminated environment. And what he found here was that sanitation, if you wish to use sanitation being the opposite of open defecation, um, is one that, um, that sanitation may account for more than half of the difference in height, e.g. stunting, between various countries. And the importance of this is actually higher. It's greater than things like uh, country GDP, which is a form of you know, average income, if you want to think of it as being related to that, mother's height, education, infrastructure. It's this business of open defecation and a lack of sanitation. So when there's open defecation going on, it means that the environment is highly contaminated with human bacteria. And so even if you live in a house where you have a latrine, you wash your hands, everything is OK, when you go to visit your friends, your neighbors, or your children go over there to play, they are now exposed to this unsanitary environment. So the point that I'm making here is that there are um, implications for both what goes on within the household in terms of water and sanitation, but also the larger community can contribute through their unsanitary behavior to your health here. In Spears' economic analysis of, of this, where he looked at height for age, which is um, um, a marker that we use for stunting, um, you can see that there's a relationship of height for age and with uh, the, a lack of sanitation. So less sanitation, a lower height for age. There's more stunting. And that is, this is data from. Please continue. <laughs> OK. So again, the point that I was trying to make was that this issue of sanitation when we look at it, um, is much more important than we had thought. We had thought sanitation was related to diarrheal disease, as I showed in an earlier, earlier slide. However, the point that I'd like to make is that we have fairly good data that sanitation and population density um, go beyond just diarrheal disease, but to stunting in general. And this fits in with the environmental enteropathy that I mentioned before. This slide is from Spears as well. And it simply shows that mortality rates, both in India and in Africa, rise as you see more open defecation, which is a marker of lack of sanitation. So you can see, both in India and in Africa, that mortality rates go up the more there is a lack of sanitation in a community. I think we're back on target now in terms of the discussion about aflatoxins. I'm sorry for uh, that slide being out of order earlier on. 
So aflatoxins, this is a picture of fungusy corn. Doesn't look very attractive. You wouldn't want to eat this. This is cassava, and this is a picture of cassava in uh, Uganda. Picture I took, and you can see it's yellow and green colored from all of the fungus growing on it. This cassava is being dried on the ground where water can pool. And where water pools, then the fungus may grow on the food itself. So aflatoxins are compounds made by mold. And it's been known for many years that they cause liver cancer. What is not as widely appreciated is that it's been known for well over 30 years in the animal industry, e.g. food producers, that aflatoxins in the food for various poultry or cows or pigs and so forth lead to decreased growth. We believe that is the case for people as well. And so aflatoxins in food can contribute to these um, uh, lower birth weight, growth, stunting, and wasting in children. It may also affect the immunity of people with HIV. And it's now been found that aflatoxins are widespread on many crops. This is a visual representation of that. This is a paper that was published in the British Medical Journal back in 2002. And you can see that as, for example, height for age or stunting gets worse, aflatoxin levels in the blood of these children went up as well. The same thing was true for weight for age here. It's rare in the world that we see a relationship as strong as this. When we look at envir environmental enteropathy and stunting, it is likely that both the um, uh, environmental enteropathy caused by contaminated water and, height and poor hygiene, which uh, infects the intestine, is matched by a similar process where these aflatoxins also do damage to the intestine and contribute to an intestine which is not functional in the way that it should. Now, aflatoxins, um, um, the, the mold that causes them can contaminate crops in the field. Um, and then they grow and they produce the aflatoxins. They are found not only uh, in the food, they will be passed in breast milk by mothers to their young infants. I'd like to point out that many of the complementary foods, such as the porridges that are baby foods that are given to kids, um, are also frequently contaminated, contaminated with aflatoxins as well. So there are important issues that have to do with harvesting and storage of crops to prevent the growth of these molds and to prevent the toxin production, uh, uh, which can result. This is a slide which um, I, I don't have any evidence. No one knows this. But for example, if aflatoxins cause a leaky intestine by damaging the intestine, then does that mean that, for example, if mother has HIV and she's breastfeeding, does that mean there's higher rates of HIV transmission? We don't know the answers to these questions. There is a lot to be learned um, in, in terms of science that's still to be done. Uh, this paper, this little slide here, is simply to point out that if you can prevent the growing of the molds in these foods, then you'll see that there's less aflatoxins in the food. And there's less aflatoxin in the blood of the children who eat those foods. So you can make a difference with agricultural practices to improve the health of these children who are eating this, and the adults as well. Um, I'd just like to point out that this last year's World Food Prize included one for aflatoxin advocacy. OK. Um, let me just go on to this slide here, which is one which puts all of these pieces together in terms of water and the environment. And that is that we know of a cycle between malnutrition and, um, and uh, infection, which many people have recognized in the past. Um, I think that the modern interpretation of this would be that there is a negative cycle between malnutrition and with having 
an intestine which is inflamed. It can be affected by pathogens from dirty water. Farm hygiene is therefore important. Aflatoxins, which are related to water content and drying practices, can also affect the intestine. And I'd also like to point out that all of the other factors that we know of, such as practices around feeding and so forth, can contribute in this diagram as well. This picture here is one where um, it portrays where agricultural interventions, interventions that have to do with water and sanitation and nutrition may fit within a cycle. What's, dem what's pictured here is a child uh, it, uh, eating aflatoxin contaminated food, so therefore the uh, things that have to do with agricultural interventions could make a difference here. Wash interventions could keep bad bacteria from making their way into this poor child, so the child would then be able to take advantage of the nutrition that is available to him or her. And it's important to understand and remember that the nutrition interventions which have been identified to date are critical in this, in this picture and, and, and need to be kept up. But we must also, I, I think, address these things that have to do with interventions in terms of toxins such as aflatoxins and bad bacteria and so forth which come because of a lack of water and sanitation. Um, if we achieve that, then to go back to this earlier diagram, then what happens is we don't have these bad pathogens coming in, we don't have the aflatoxins coming into the intestine, and then the child is able to take advantage of these nutrients. Take-home messages are quite straightforward. We need good varied nutrition. We need to keep toxins out of our diet, uh, which are going to uh, adversely affect our growth. We need to have good water and sanitation, uh, a clean environment, which keeps us from developing this environmental enteropathy, the inflammation that we see with that, et cetera, and keeps our gut microbiome, that is the balance of bacteria in the intestine, um, within a normal uh, spectrum. Now, let me leave it at that, and thanks very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Jeff, uh, for this really very nice comprehensive presentation. Um, now we'll go uh, move to Dr. Webb's presentation on ag sector approaches to address malnutrition. Hello, everyone. I'm assuming you can hear me. Uh, we've had two very good, deep presentations by uh, Dr. Kablan and Dr. Griffiths, focused on nutrition, health biomedical processes and the problems. And so I'm going to bring things a little more uh, in towards the domain of agriculture and how that links with those. And I'm going to start with uh, the takeaway messages, which are quite important. Um, one is that, as uh, Dr. Griffiths mentioned, we can't do without agriculture. While all of that presentation was really about nutrition and and health, the role of agriculture in the processes we've been hearing about is, is key. And since the world food price crises of 2007, 2008, the huge surge of attention towards agriculture, food systems, and so on, uh, really implies that we have to continue uh, traditional, conventional research in agricultural productivity in all its forms. That is a given, but we can go further and we have to go further. Uh, there are many ways in which the Innovation Labs and other USAID-supported research activities can go beyond productivity enhancement towards impacting nutrition in net positive ways. The value added is huge and, of course, the, the high-end goals of Feed the Future is not just produce more food uh, for a healthy agriculture. It's actually to achieve a um, produce more nutrition. The bell was in the background is correct. Um, so we have to take this on as, as 
a part of the agricultural uh, agenda. The purpose of a healthy agriculture, a sustainable agriculture is of course, of course enhanced and sustained healthy people the consumers who are also the producers. But we have to also take into account that simply investing in agriculture, investing in agricultural research, that alone is not going to cut it. It's, nutrition doesn't happen by accident. It has to happen by design. And to achieve it and to document its impact, it has to be carefully measured and the, the impacts have to be demonstrated at scale. So these are the, 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 the broad issues that uh, we're going to be uh, dealing with. Now both uh, Dr. Kavlan and Griffiths uh, talked about stunting and I want to re-emphasize the importance of stunting. Not only is it a feed the future um, goal, Action to reduce stunting is not just a luxury, it's not just a, a goal, that something that will happen uh, by itself if we, if we produce more food or reduce poverty. There's still over, well over 160 million stunted children and I point out that the under five population in the U.S. currently is about 20 million. So many, many times the U.S. under five population around the world are stunted and this matters because we can't achieve other goals in reducing preventable child mortality unless we re uh, resolve stunting. Uh, severely stunted children, not just wasted, but severely stunted children are five times more likely to die of something like diarrheal disease than a, a healthy, uh, well-nourished child. Maternal stunting, so even if a child survives and grows up to be uh, an adult, particularly a mother, if they are stunted, then the risk factor for having small births for gestational age uh, increases considerably. And we now know that about 20% of stunting of the child by age three probably has origins in the nutritional compromise of the mother during the fetal period. So there's a lot of issues here that we have to address. 80%, uh, Dr. Kaplan mentioned the 34 developing countries, 80% of them of stunted children live in those countries, which means that it is manageable. If we find the right things to do in those stunting, uh, in those countries, of course others as well, uh, then we can have a major impact. Uh, but because stunting is an equity issue and the poorer children are more likely to be stunted than richer, and most poor people are in rural areas, then the entry point for addressing stunting may well partially lie with agriculture. And of course, that's where we need to, to go. Currently, if we just keep on uh, with the way we're doing things by 2025, there will still be almost 130 million stunted children uh, around, and that compromises uh, development, mental development in school, it compromises their productivity in agriculture. In other words, the stunting, the malnutrition in all its forms contributes to low productivity in agriculture. It's not simply a, an outcome of it. Hence, the growing and increasing uh, number of reports and research outputs and goals that link agriculture with nutrition outcomes. In other words, it's not just a responsibility of the Ministry of Health to deal with nutrition. The Lancet series, Dr. Greffis uh, and Dr. Kaplan both mentioned the Lancet series last uh, summer from, uh, on maternal and child nutrition, pointed out that there are 10 evidence-based interventions, targeted interventions, that if we implemented them up to 90% coverage in those 34 countries, then we would be able to cut stunting by say 20% and mortality by 15% um, in those 34 countries. And these are things like vitamin A supplementation, uh, uh, iron and folate distribution to, to pregnant women and so on. The problem is that in those countries, uh, like many other developing countries, coverage rates are very, very low. And the investment needed to bring coverage up to 90% in those kinds of countries, the ones that Dr. Kaplan mentioned, uh, would be very costly, $9.6 billion uh, per annum. The, the killer here, though, is that even if we manage to achieve 90% coverage of those 10 targeted interventions, 
that only reduces stunting by 20%, which means 80% of stunting still unresolved. This is a problem. And of course, then it brings us to start looking at nutrition sensitive actions. Now, 20 years ago, it was very common to claim or assume that producing more food, and here that usually meant more calories, would imply an improvement in nutrition and health. Uh, very common uh, to see those statements uh, that far back. Today, we know that that's actually not the case. Just producing more food isn't a guarantee of improved nutrition outcomes if you actually measure the outcomes rather than simply assume them. And even the FAO will now say explicitly that investments in agriculture are not in and of themselves sufficient to improve nutrition. Times have changed. We understand that the agriculture can potentially play a hugely important role, but we have to be more explicit about when and in what context the impacts on nutrition are likely to be achieved. So we start talking not just about nutrition specific interventions from the Lancet, but nutrition sensitive interventions. Those interventions that can, at least in theory, impact on nutrition if they effectively address the underlying determinants of nutrition and have specific nutrition goals and actions embedded in what they try to achieve and how they measure their outcomes. The, the if is really important. You cannot assume it will happen, but if you do it correctly, then we can probably measure the outcomes. Now, just to give an, uh, an example of why you can't assume uh, it will happen. This is one example of rice commercialization from a long time ago um, in West Africa. Um, the introduction, the new crop technology here, the introduction of uh, rice, uh, high yielding varieties of rice with irrigation led to higher productivity in rice production, which resulted in higher household uh, net income and sales and consumption, not just of rice, but of other foods. Uh, which was having a measurable impact on women and children eating better, which is great. No, um, no suggestion that this isn't what you would want to see. Uh, and in fact, we can measure how that happens. The higher productivity was in fact uh, due to the irrigation and the, the higher yields uh, resulted in three times higher net returns per day of labor, so higher factor productivity in labor which translated into a net real increase in income for, for households adopting this technology of about 13% per household per year net, so uh, incorporating understanding of costs and higher labor inputs to this. And that resulted in itself to a net gain to the households of all, almost 50% uh, of calories in this case, so energy deriving from all the foods um, resulting. So what was going on was you could translate that in a different way, that for every 10% increase in net income, you saw almost a 5% increase in calorie availability in the household. And for every 10% increase in calories available to the household, you saw an almost 2.5% increase uh, in nutritional status, so a fall in undernutrition. So the, the moral of this particular story is that you got through the adoption of new technologies, higher productivity, which increased income, which increased calorie availability, which did improve child nutrition just a little bit. And what we have to try understand from this is that it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. There's a lot going on between the point of adoption of a technology and the outcomes in nutrition that explain why there seems to be a dilution of the effect as you go forward. You could see this in a more linear uh, way, if you like. Um, if you assume uh, there's a lot going on between the agriculture and livelihood side and the health and nutrition side. And on the agricultural side, there are lots of programs that measure participation in a program, technology adoption, income effects 
of productivity. That's lots of things that agriculture uh, programs and research often measure, but often don't measure the rest of the chain. And on the other hand, on nutrition and health programming and research often looks at dietary composition and food expenditure and nutrition outcomes without actually looking upstream at what got us there. And there is a lot going on between the adoption of new technology and the nutritional status that is coming out at the other end that you might assume or that you might actually perceive and measure. Some of these things uh, were just mentioned. Uh, irrigation can increase malaria. Increased con concentration of, of poultry could be a contributor to bird flu if poorly managed, pesticides can have an effect. Empowerment, income control matters a great deal in terms of how income is used and whether programs are ensuring that there is gen they are gender sensitive and understanding female control of those, um, the income derived, and that there's no compromise to the, the opportunity costs of time of women as well as men, and the trade-offs if you do one thing versus another. On the other side, diet quality matters a great deal. Uh, it's not simply growing more of the same, but ensuring diversity of cropping as is key to gr greater diversity of diet, but often you need enhanced knowledge, behavior change, communication, education to understand what's going on on the other side. And then Dr. Griffiths mentioned the environmental enteropathy, the various uh, mycotoxins that can compromise what is going on between the food going into the mouth and the nutritional status of the, con of the consumer. So there are, while this, this is a linear relationship, participation in a program in theory is a straight line towards nutritional status, actually it's a very complex line. And it's one that incorporate that we need to understand a lot more what's going on in these boxes and in the arrows to be able to, to understand where to invest, both in research and uh, in the agricultural programming we're concerned with. Now, there are lots of possible innovations, lots of current innovations going on in agricultural research and programming around the world supported by different missions, genetic advances in re incre improving the quality, the diversity, the impact in nutrition of various seeds, whether they be vegetable seeds or biofortified staples or higher yielding of, uh, species of, of animals. But we also have to look at programming and process innovations. Where and when is it appropriate for agriculture to be a platform for ensuring not just more is grown, but actually more quality is embedded into both the agricultural package and the consumption package that results. What models are there out there that could be replicated at scale of combining, for example, in South Asia, aquaculture with, say, orange sweet flesh potato, with homestead gardens off season, that together, as opposed to individually, can enhance nutrition? And when can, for example, uh, there be effective cross-training of agricultural extension workers? Um, with uh, behavior change communication. Um, Aaron was asking uh, the HKI example of Burkina Faso. There are very many examples of HKI style uh, combinations, not just from HKI anymore, um, of um, homestead models with vegetables, with small ruminants, with agriculture, and with aquaculture, and so on. When can we get uh, health workers to incorporate better messaging on agriculture, when can we get social mobilizers to uh, incorporate better understanding of both agriculture's potential positive and negative impacts on health and nutrition. And of course then, how can we do a better job of capturing evidence of best practice and dissemination of what is what works and what it is that we need to measure as we go forward to demonstrate value added of combining the, what we do collectively. Now, you, many of you have heard of the six pathways. I'm sure anyone who's been to an, a USAID Glee has, understood, has been hearing the six pathways from agriculture and nutrition. Uh, that are spelled out uh, in, usually in linear fashion. Here I've put them in a wheel. Uh, so that we can understand that actually they are all, each of these uh, t potential ways 
of of having agriculture impact on nutrition. If you imagine nutrition is at the at the core here, at the center here, there's lots of research, there's lots of programming that cuts across these different um, sectors of potential impact, increasing and improving uh, yields and drought resistance and the, the value of both staple and commercial yields, the increasing focus on w women owned or women controlled uh, animals, uh, vegetables, fruits through homestead gardening, uh, integrated pre pest management, livestock vaccines which keep um, the diversity of species alive, increasing focus on the quality of seed, biofortification, food safety through uh, storage improvement, uh, on-farm improvement, reduction of post-harvest losses. You can see there's a. these are not individual pieces. They all contribute together to enhancing the potential contributions of agriculture, both research and programming, to the nutrition outcomes that we're trying to achieve. That said, one could argue, one could spend a little time identifying where is it that we have less information. And I think we rel have relatively less information on how to measure, what to measure, how, what, how to influence women's health and nutrition in relation to agriculture, women's opportunity costs of time and effort when relating to agriculture versus other things that they could be doing, supporting health and nutrition of their children, women's empowerment and resource control. And then, of course, women's control, not just of production, but also value chain development, uh, market price development, and the, the net outcomes in prices for goods that, that women control. So I think we need to think very carefully about where it is that um, investments going forward in both agriculture research and programming and policy will have greater aggregate synergistic effects. Uh, Dr. Kablan said all sectors need to work together and I think that ultimately is the, the conclusion that we, we need to take away here. Agriculture needs to be understanding that it has in itself a responsibility for addressing nutrition, not just growing more food but addressing nutrition, but it's not going to do that alone. We have to find ways in which all the innovation labs and all the different sectors within USAID missions can work together to have uh, greater impacts on nutrition that are measurable. There is no question that we are going to have greater impact the, better, the more rigorous the evidence we have of that impact. That requires us to have gender disaggregated, very good cost effectiveness, as well as process um, evidence of what works in what contexts. Anecdotes and numbers fed or we, growed more, we grew more f food and therefore we improved nutrition, that's not enough. That simply won't cut it anymore. There's lots of scope for innovation in the ag field uh, to have impact on the nutrition field, but we all collectively have to work on generating the evidence of best practice. And the only way of doing that is through collaboration. I'll stop there and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roy, for this really very interesting and uh, that uh, looked at overall how the agriculture sector will play together with other uh, programs, such as health programs and feeding to uh, the, how they should work together to produce the, uh, the, uh, the result that we want. Now we'll pass it to Dr. Mack to give us an overview of the USAID focus on nutrition and program. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm going to give a brief overview of USAID. Since the beginning of USAID's existence, nutrition has been a key focus area. And that said, That said, there has never been as much attention or as many resources devoted to nutrition, both in USAID and globally, as we are now seeing. And this is really an unprecedented situation. Okay. 
As demonstration of USAID's commitment to nutrition, we're in the process of finalizing a USAID nutrition strategy. Now, this has been under development for more than six months and reflects the input of more than 100 stakeholders globally. The strategy emphasizes <clears throat> the importance of a multi-sectoral programming approach that is implemented in collaboration with a broad spectrum of stakeholders, including host country governments at all levels, civil society organizations, the private sector, and academia, in coordination with the international donor community and UN agencies, with the aim being to reduce malnutrition among the world's most vulnerable populations. The USA Nutrition Strategy is targeted for a spring 2014 release date. And as soon as it's available, I'll be sure to make it available to you through your AOR. Now, in addition to the USAID-specific nutrition strategy, a process is now underway for developing a whole of US government nutrition strategy with a target completion date of late 2014. The goal of this whole of government strategy is to coordinate our collective efforts so that we can maximize the impact of our US government resource resources <clears throat> on reaching World Health Assembly and post-MDG's nutrition targets for improving nutrition outcomes globally. There's basically four main points I want to make during this uh, presentation. So this, what I've just said here, is my first main point. My second point relates to four key concepts that are driving USAID's current nutrition-related activities. And these are, first of all, integration. There is a strong, a very strong push right now from the highest levels in USAID to ensure that nutritional considerations are integrated into all Feed the Future agricultural and research programs in the 19 focus countries where Feed the Future is working. The second concept is multi-sectoral multi-stakeholder collaboration. And this is to build on what Dr. Webb has just uh, presented. <clears throat> and as I mentioned previously, marching orders are to get away from siloed programming and to replace it by sectoral approaches to solving. On end, not just nutrition, in collaboration with multiple stakeholders. <clears throat> The third concept is our focus on evidence-based approaches and not practices based on assumptions. Now, this is where you all play a critical role. The research that you and your colleagues are undertaking in the innovation labs and the co collaborative research programs is providing the necessary evidence base for the technologies, approaches, and interventions that are contributing to improved nutrition and health not only in our Feed the Future focus countries, but in other countries around the world. And the fourth concept that we are emphasizing here at USAID currently is results. And we're talking about, about results now in the next year, looking at intermediate results. We know that longer term results, such as decreased stunting, take several years to achieve. And so that's why we're focusing on results and looking at, in the immediate, the intermediate results, such as improving dietary diversity, reducing maternal anemia, etc. The third point I'd like to make today relates to the Feed the Future Food Security Innovation Center. Now, this is a a concept that was launched in the past year. And it's the way that Feed the Future is implementing is its research agenda. Within the Innovation Center, there are 23 innovation labs and 10 multi-donor funded collaborative research programs that are under the CGIAR system. These labs 
And um, okay, I see that the slides are moving around. <laughs> okay, um, excuse me one second here. These labs and programs are organized around seven research, research themes, one of which is nutritious and safe foods. Now, this slide here provides the listing of the various innovation labs and collaborative research programs that are under the, safe and nutrition, the nutritious and safe foods program. So you can see there's quite a number here. All of these research programs have a hook to nutrition, some more explicitly than others. Now, the Nutrition Innovation Labs for Asia and Africa and the Collaborative Research Program number four, Agriculture for Nutrition and Health, that is being implemented by IFPRI, these are the ones that are specifically nutrition focused. But all of these innovation labs and programs do have a clear uh, connection to improving nutrition. And as Dr. Webb mentioned, all of our research programs under the Food Security Innovation Lab all have strong potential for improving nutrition in the Feed the Future zones of influence. Presently, working with Ahmed Kablan and another nutrition uh, colleague here at USAID to review the research programs of the innovation labs that are members of the nutritious and safe food programs program. The aim of our review is to, to identify possible opportunities for enhancing the nutritional contribution and impact of these and other programs. So more to come on this once we complete our review. And finally, the fourth point I'd like to touch on today is that the Nutrition Innovation Labs for Asia and Africa are a key partner in our efforts to better understand and address nutrition through the agriculture sector. They are a valuable resource and a willing partner for consultation and collaboration with other innovation labs and collaborative research programs. I'd just like to mention that a sub-award with the Nutrition Innovation Labs is always an option if you would like them to work with you on a specific scope of work, either to integrate or enhance the nutritional dimension of your research programs. So with that, I'd like to turn the program over to Dr. Webb, who will speak more about the Nutrition Innovation Labs. Thank you, Maura. Um, you said it very eloquently. Um, we here as the Nutrition Innovation Labs to help as much as is desired and appropriate. Um, this is just uh, literally just three, four slides just to, to get the uh, discussion going. Um, the, there are different ways in which uh, collaboration with us, but of course we, it doesn't have to be with us, but collaboration with the Innovation Lab, the Nutrition Innovation Labs can take many forms. Our own Innovation Lab research is uh, called deep dive research because it's focused first and foremost in two major countries, um, Uganda and Nepal, although we have additional work in, in other countries like Egypt and um, Malawi and potentially others in uh, around the world. Um, our own research in those countries uh, offers the basis for collaboration uh, given that we are focused on panel data collection, so re re revisiting the same households, the same mothers, the same children over uh, multiple years. Uh, we have a prospective cohort design for certain components, which means following uh, mothers from, through pregnant, from pregnancy through, through birth and growth of children. We have sentinel sites set up in Nepal, for example, uh, three different agroecologies. Um, where we're looking at uh, seasonality and, and dynamic prices and rainfall and all kinds of additional uh, components, uh, as well as doing uh, blood and serum collection in certain cases that can assess not just micronutrient status of, um, uh, of women and children, 
uh, but could potentially also look at aflatoxin contamination and other, other, other aspects. So we are doing uh, research ourselves focused on how agriculture impacts nutrition through various uh, forms of integrated programming packages. We're looking at some of those neglected, so, so far neglected biological mechanisms that we've talked about, aflatoxins, uh, water quality, the effect of gut microbiome, and we're linking with other uh, nutrition labs in doing these kinds of research. We're also looking more explicitly at programming performances and the costs of, of taking things to scale and the constraints to implementation when you have multiple partners, as well as nutrition governance, m much larger issues around policy making and how national partners um, can be uh, part of the solution and, and uh, not part of the problem uh, in a collaboration. Um, to give you an example of, of the potential for potentially piggybacking or linking with research, in Nepal we're, we're conducting research in 24 different locations that include three major different agroecologies and all kinds of different rural as well as peri-urban uh, sites. This gives an opportunity for understanding all kinds of different um, intervention types, um, uh, as I said, agroecologies, soil types, climate types. Same in, in Uganda where uh, in different districts, in both in the center north and in the far south, uh, very different environments where we can explore a variety of activities in collaboration with multiple partners. So our own uh, work offers a a potential platform, a synergistic platform, where we can link with other labs and other uh, research partners. We can link outside of those countries, validating metrics for assessment of the actual impact of agriculture interventions. Uh, there's a lot to be done there in terms of validating new ways of measuring new combined um, indicators and so on. We can work with partners in building capacity of individuals as well as institutions, um, either supporting or facilitating or guy is simply giving advice on what kinds of training are needed, uh, local curriculum development in um, country settings uh, where national counterparts have, have requested assistance in building capacity, uh, as in Malawi, for example, in dietetics programs, in Nepal, in master's degree programs um, in, in nutrition, for example. Uh, we have already been collaborating with multiple uh, innovation lab partners in looking at, the, looking at their own RFAs they put out to see how nutrition sensitive they are, um, what else could be included to make them more nutrition uh, impactful, what kind of instruments would be required, how best to measure, how best to design surveys uh, to actually document impact. And, and then, of course, assisting going beyond individual country uh, collaborations to regional collaborations, building lessons learned, evidence base that with partners that go well beyond our conventional um, agriculture uh, partners. So our collaborators uh, currently are actually from already many more than this, but we have a range of academic, uh, UN, governmental and non-governmental partners with whom we work in just a couple of, these are just the partners in Nepal and Uganda, many other partners as well. Uh, so we, we stand ready to support and to facilitate collaboration um, uh, along these different lines of research and capacity building to the extent that we can. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roy, for uh, this very brief, sweet presentation. Um, would you like to take a Jennifer Ermit question about moving forward? How, how can we scale uh, to include LAC region? Uh, Jennifer, you're muted. Uh, we have, I, I will def actually defer to, to, um, to Dr. Griffiths, but we have already had discussions with other partners in Guatemala for um, and have had uh, additional missions express interest, even if they were not uh, feed the future priority <coughs> countries. Uh, maybe Moro also would like to, to comment on that.
This is Jeff Griffiths. So while Moore is preparing, I just say that I, I, I think that um, all of the team members for the Innovation Labs for Nutrition would be interested in, in uh, scaling to include the LAC region. I mean, cer certainly many of the issues which we're looking at already. Oh, it seems, well, we've been, uh, seems like we lost Jeffrey for a moment there. Um, and we're also trying to get Maura's audio back up. We'll let her test. I, I do not hear Maura quite yet. Um, <clears throat> so in the meantime, as we get some of the audio sorted out, uh, please feel free to enter any other questions that you have, um, whether it be general about the content or uh, more specific about the innovation lab or labs that you're working with, um, your specific program. Sure. It's a good shot to get these guys um, while they are available. And yes, I heard someone, so please feel free to jump back in. I see that there's a question from Elizabeth Ryan about uh, optimization of the of um, the uh, of a person's metabolism um, by adjusting the gut microbiome. It's an extremely hot area, and I think that many of us um, are hopeful that specific interventions in terms of um, the, the kind of um, foods that feed a specific kind of microbiome and mm -hmm. things like water and sanitation to keep the bad bacteria away. So while we're promoting the good and keep the bad out, that that will have a major impact on nutrition outcomes. I see there's also another question from Aaron. Um, and um, basically, um, the, that question is how environmental enteropathy research is being received by nutrition and ag communities. Um, I hear a lot of interest, and I think that it helps people to understand um, what it is about what they're doing in terms of agricultural um, uh, productivity and the availability of various kinds of foodstuffs and link to that. I think we've got levels, okay. We lost. I think there's a, there's a lot of enthusiasm there um, once people can kind of see that direct connection, that biological connection. So the, so the answer that, to Aaron's question also is, do I see WASH beginning to be more strongly integrated? Um, I certainly am seeing indications of that. Um, sometimes programming is like trying to move, trying to get a large ship. Is anyone is speaking right. We lost. And so it takes a while to do that. Uh, certainly, historically, there's been a tremendous amount of interest in WASH, and so uh, bringing that to bear uh, is there's already a cadre of people who are really interested with a lot of experience. Thank you, Jeffrey, for those answers. Um, sorry, here in the DC control room, we we're having a bit of microphone issues and on a bit of a delay, but we um, we got your answers there loud and clear, Jeffrey. Uh, which is great. And um, Maura, I think you should be able to yeah. speak now. All righty. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, to respond to your question about scaling to include the LAC region, yes, of interest to us, as uh, Patrick had mentioned, we had in the recent past been in touch with the USAID Guatemala mm -hmm. about possible collaboration. In essence, right now, we're working primarily in Feed the Future countries, but that does not preclude us from collaborating with other uh, USAID missions in other non-Feed the Future countries. So it really is a question just of either ex expressed interest from a mission, a Feed the Future program there, or um, us also reaching out, which we have also been doing recently with a number of countries that aren't necessarily Feed the Future. So Latin America would definitely be a possibility. Right now, Feed the Future is in Guatemala and Haiti. Um, but if you have any suggestions, please feel free to pass them on to us. Thank you.
Thank you, Maura. And please continue to type in your questions. We'll stick around for a few more minutes in case any other questions come along. Um, Ahmed, I didn't know if you might want to mention um, the idea for ways that people can continue to stay involved and ask further questions going forward. Um, and uh, we had discussed the possibility of, of office hours in the future, um, ways that people can connect back to uh, the Nutrition innovation. Your audio will come through on this answer. Uh, uh, yes. yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So for uh, for the way forward, we are thinking, especially around the launch of the USA the nutrition strategy, to have a monthly nutrition office hour. It will be more of a web chat uh, hosted by the same group uh, or through, uh, AgriLinks. Um, also, if you have any question, any suggestion, any comment, please uh, email me and Mora, and we'll make sure that uh, we'll get to you to the right uh, collaborator if it is about collaboration or to the right uh, to get you the right answer. And uh, of course, if you are an innovation lab, if you contact me and Mora, please also CC your AOR and activity manager at USAID to make sure they are in the loop. Great, thank you, Ahmed. Um, and it seems as though uh, that answers some of Jennifer's question there at the bottom about how you can maintain contact with us uh, to stay updated on nutrition-sensitive interventions. And this is Patrick. I, I would um, be happy to interact with and answer questions from uh, anyone uh, going forward. Uh, please don't feel shy. Uh, reaching out to us, um, and and you will always get a response as quickly as we can possibly do it. Uh, sometimes we'll have to say no, we can't help, but uh, on the whole, we'll always try and be as uh, as helpful as possible because uh, this is a, such an important agenda that affects all of our labs and all USAID programming. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and yes, this. Uh, presentation will be archived and uh, we'll make sure to send an email to all of you with the recording and the PowerPoint just so that you have uh, these resources from today's webinar. Uh, I see there's a little bit more typing going on um, in the chat box. If anyone has any final questions or comments, please feel free to jump in. Uh, Cynthia, I can see that you're typing and Jeffrey as well. Um, oh, thank you, Cynthia, and thanks, Aaron. I'm glad that you found this valuable. And uh, Jeffrey, yes, is also willing to hear uh, about any questions or collaborations. So we definitely want to keep the lines of communication open here as much as possible. Thank you, Jeffrey and Patrick, for uh, spreading the word and reaching out and being open for to answer a question and providing support for us and other uh, collaborators with us. Great. Thank you all. Well, then I think we will go ahead and uh, officially wrap up this webinar. We are right on time, just a few minutes after our official ending time. So thank you all very much for joining. I hope you found it useful. I know I certainly uh, found the really concise summaries of the issues very useful and will be reviewing uh, the slides myself. So we'll be sure to send them out to you as well. And um, that's about it. So thank you all. Have a great rest of the day. And we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you.